It's good to be saved tonight, amen? I appreciate what God's done here. I've, I've had a heavy heart since I walked into church tonight. And uh, I didn't uh, usually, uh, the Lord will direct me in many different ways of what to preach. And uh, I try my best to be very sensitive to the Holy Spirit because I do not want to grieve Him. And uh, I fully understand that at any moment God has a desire to change your life and my life. And uh, we are not to look at a church service like it's just another service, but we ought to come to church every time expecting God to do something eternal and powerful in our lives. And... Um, what God has been doing here over the last couple of days is not usual. And um, this morning I was very, very, very impressed. Uh, we came here for high school chapel and uh, I'll be honest, a lot of times when I go to Christian school high school chapels, um, nothing happens, nothing moves. And uh, usually it's discouraging at best. Uh, but this morning the presence of God I met with us in this church with all these young people, and I wish you could have seen these altars slap full of young people as God began to work on their hearts and in their lives. And uh, you can't replace that. I can't duplicate that, and you can't duplicate that. That's a working of the Holy Spirit of God. And it's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And uh, when God does a movement like this, I'm very, very... Uh, probably hard on myself because I want to make sure that I have what God wants me to preach for the night. And uh, the Lord, when I walked in, put something on my heart that I haven't really dealt with a lot. But I do want to do my best to do what God has asked me to do tonight. I do want to preach a very, very serious subject tonight. And if you can help me and uh, nobody moving around and not... Uh, the, the, when I preach on this subject, the devil does everything he can to distract and pull away. And what I need you to do is I need you to pretend or think, or, or it might be the true case, that the person beside you is dying and going to hell, and this might be their last chance. If there's any obstacles, if there's anything going on, help me. Just help me. And uh, let's, let's see God do something tonight. Amen. Uh, you young people, do your best to be attentive and uh, pay attention to the Word of God tonight. I, I won't be long, and uh, I'll do my best not to bore you. Uh, I want you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 tonight. Becky's grandfather, Donald Sanders, uh, drove in from Missouri tonight, and uh, he's a preacher up there in Missouri, and uh, he's a preaching machine, and uh, he drove in. Becky's going to go to Missouri for a couple of days, and I appreciate him being here tonight. And uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 16. The Word of God says here, Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. Boy, this, this unnerves me reading this part of this verse. I remember being a little kid the first time I ever heard this verse and it scared me to death. He was rejected for he found no place of repentance though he sought it carefully with tears. How could that be? We've always been taught that you come to God and ask God to forgive you and, and, and do that that God will automatically forgive but, but that's not what the Bible just said. The Bible said that Esau got to such a place 
that even though when he broke down and with tears in his eyes trying to repent to God, that he found no place to repent. Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you, help me now, don't turn me all the way down, I was, I was good. Uh, I submit to you that there is a line that you can cross where it's too late. I do not preach on this arrogantly. I do not preach on this with a happy spirit. But I do come tonight with what God's put on my heart to let you know that there is a line that you can cross with God when you'll find no place of repentance. I want to preach on this thought tonight when it's too late to cry. When it's too late to cry. Spiritually speaking, I don't know if you can imagine this in your mind, but there is a clock. And uh, it's, it's better than the world clock. It's, it keeps better time than any other clock in the world. And that clock has been registered with the Word of God. And everything lines up with this clock. And there is a deadline on this clock. And I believe with all of my heart that before this service is over, that the clock could reach midnight and that Jesus could come back after his bride in these last days. I believe with all my heart that the stage is set. All the prophecies have been fulfilled. Everything is said and done. All that is waiting is for God to give the nod to his son and say, go get my children. I believe with all of my heart and with every bit of my being that Jesus is coming back. And hear me well, when Jesus comes back, it will be too late to cry. A couple of things Esau was profane. He was sinful in his behavior. Esau sold his birthright. It should, the inheritance should have been his, but he sold it out thinking he had enough time maybe to buy it back or to get it back. For whatever reason, he sold what only God could give him. And he sought repentance with tears, but it was too late to cry. Number one, it, it'll be too late to cry after you have squandered your days. After you have squandered your days, Ecclesiastics 12 and 1 says, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. From the day you and I were born, we were born dying. There was a certain amount of days deposited in our life and every day that we wake up and stretch our arms and take a breath of a brand new day, we withdraw a day from our life. Only God knows how many days that is. Only God knows how many days we have left. But hear me well, don't listen to the devil. You're not gonna live forever. The day may be sooner or it may be later but there is a day coming when you will die and when you have squandered your days it will be too late to cry when you squandered your days how many days do you have left to live on this earth how many people sat in this church over the last five years that thought for sure they'd be here the next 15 or 20. And they're not here anymore. Because the days are like a vapor. And when those days are over, it'll be too late to cry. After you've squandered your days, look secondly, it'll be too late to cry after you've seared your conscience the Word of God says in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and 2, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Have you ever met a person that uh, for some reason or another, it just seems like they can live however they want? They can do whatever they want. Nothing convicts them. Nothing moves on them. They used to be a good moral person. They used to have a moral compass, but now they can do whatever, whenever they want to do it because they've allowed their conscience to be seared with a hot iron. No alarms go off when they see and Nothing goes off when something's wrong. They've allowed their conscience to be seared. And listen to me, born again child of God, you better take note to when the Holy Ghost of God convicts you and speaks to you because you can't push God away at such a level when he'll, your conscience will be seared. 
You don't believe that, but how many of you will get in a revival service and you start tuning to the voice of God and that voice gets so loud and that voice gets louder and louder and louder, but then a couple weeks you start backing off your Bible and you start backing off church and after a while your conscience is seared. There was a man that... All through my life, I, I, I respected him and I loved him. And after a while, his conscience became seared. And he'll even tell you that it did. And he's one of the most miserable people I know. Because in the time when he should have been listening to God, and the time that he should have been obeying God, he didn't. And his conscience is seared. It's too late to cry once you've allowed it to get to that place. Look next here. Not only after you squander your days and you sear your conscience, but after the Spirit ceases to strive with you. One of the biggest lies that's ever been hatched out of hell, and I'm fixing to get where I'm going to land and I'm going to preach for a minute, but one of the biggest lies that has ever been hatched out of hell is this philosophy when a man sits in church and the Holy Ghost deals with them and the devil will put this excuse in their brain, you can get saved later. How do you know that? How do you have that guarantee? How do you know that God is going to pass by your way again? How do you know that you'll be in the right environment for God? How do you know what God's going to do in your life? You do not know. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. It is not on your terms. It will not be on your level. It will not be of your decision. But you'll get saved. Not when you're ready, but when God's ready. Word of God said in the book of Genesis chapter 6, 1 through 3, and it came to pass when men began to multiply uh, on the face of the earth and daughters were born of them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be in 120 years. One thing that bothered me when I was running from God, is that I could get to a place. And there I could get to a place where I could keep pushing the voice of God away and God would quit dealing with me. Now, I, I'm not a theological giant. I'll let some of these other fellows figure the theology out behind this. I just want to tell you a personal story. I don't have a, 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 I don't have a stand on this. All I can tell you is what this man told me. Several years ago, I uh, was preaching a revival and it uh, did incredible and we went to church for eight solid weeks. Over a hundred people saved. The church started with maybe a hundred people every night and by the end of that revival, there was eight or, eight or so hundred people every single night inside that building. God turned that place upside down. And one night there was an older gentleman. Every night he would come back and he would sit on the left corner in the back. And I'd say, if you're lost, raise your hand. And he'd raise his hand, but he would not move. He would not budge. Nothing would do it. And every single night he'd come and shake my hand as cold as ice. One time I grabbed him. I said, sir, you keep raising your hand and saying that you're lost. I said, why don't you come and give your heart to Jesus? Why don't you come fix it? He said, I need to talk to you about that. We walked in a little counseling room, and all I'm doing is telling you what he told me. He said, Brother C.T., I was 17 years old, sitting under an old gospel tent, and Percy Ray came through my town. He said, Percy Ray preached a revival, and the power of God fell inside that town. He said people were saved by the groves left and right every single night. People were getting saved. People were under conviction. They were shutting the barred joints down. There was people getting right with God. He said, and I sat on that back row for weeks and God dealt with my heart. God tried to save me. God tried to speak to me. He said, as a 17-year-old boy, I told God to leave me alone and I wasn't getting saved. He said, CT, I walked out of that tent and I lived several years and didn't even acknowledge it. He said, and finally one day I realized that God had left me alone. 
He said, CT, I'm almost 80 years old now. He said, and I can't tell you how many times I've came back to church wanting God to deal with my heart once again. He said, but CT, I, I can't get God to deal with me. I can't get God to talk to me. Now, I'm tell, I don't know where I stand. I'm just telling you what the man told me. He got to a place where the Holy Spirit stopped striving with him. Teenager, this is not a game. It ain't cool. It ain't funny. This is life, heaven, or hell. And while we play games and try to be churchy and try to do all this stuff, your soul weighs in the balance. And while you think you got everything under control, mother or, or father, you think you got everything going on, there's way more in the balance of this thing. And you need to make sure that you don't push God out because God may cease to strive with you. Not only after, after the Spirit ceases to strive with you, but when, you're, when a saved person is useless as a Christian, too late to cry. There's people in this room, and I'll not stay here long, but God's given you things, and God's birthed things in your heart and in your life. And how many Christians do you know personally that had talent and ability. They had charisma. They had so many tools that God could use in their life. But because like Esau that sold his birthright, they are ineffective. It doesn't mean God doesn't love them. It doesn't mean that God might not have a plan B. But it does mean that their sinful ways and their sinful life has landed them in a category where they are ineffective as a child of God. The Bible says that the Spirit of God withdrew from the life of Saul and he didn't even know it. It's one thing to say, I don't want God to use me. It's another thing to know that God can't. I, I could tell you story after story and I'm not going to, but I met a man in Chicago just this past year, grew up in church, grew up near me, went to a big, large church to work on staff and had a good family, good all this stuff and started messing around with jobs and with pornography and all these different things and ended up lost his wife and lost his children and he sat there in that church with tears in his eyes and he said, Brother C.T., he said, please warn the people. He said, I didn't listen to the preaching. I didn't listen to the house of God. He said, now my wife is gone. She doesn't love me. My kids are gone. They don't even want to talk to me. He said, I've lost it all because I did not listen to what the Word of God had to say. He said, now I'm ineffective as a child of God. And ladies and gentlemen, there are some things that you and I can do that we can cry till morning comes, but crying ain't going to fix it. Sin will render you ineffective as a child of God. And then lastly, this is what I wanted to get to. Not only when sin renders you ineffective as a Christian, but when your soul slides into hell. That rich man was in hell, the Word of God said, and he was in hell, and he said, would somebody please bring me just a drop of water that it may cool my tongue and quench my thirst. All eternity, he said, warn my family, warn my friends, don't come to this awful place. It was too late to cry. Because hell is an eternal place. You see how much the devil hates when we preach on stuff like this. Y'all feel how tight it is in here right now? We've had liberty all week long. But I'm telling you, this, that this is why. Because we're on the enemy's ground right now. And the devil's doing everything he can to tie this thing down. But hell, whether or not you believe in it or don't believe in it, is a very real place. 
And ladies and gentlemen, I, I need some people to pray me through this. I need some people to know how to get a hold of God to pray. But you listen to me, you listen to me well. Hell is a very real, hell is a very vital, hell is a very uh, a real place. The Word of God says that hell hath enlarged herself. The Word of God teaches us that it's a place where the worm dieth not with weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hey, listen to me. It's a place that is real. It's eternal. It's forever. And if you die without Christ, it's a place that once you get there, it'll be too late to cry. Amen. I remember growing up in West Virginia and there was a, a boy that lived on the other side of the creek and we'd go over there and play ball and uh, me and my brother would witness to him and, and, uh, and old BJ, he, 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 we'd say, uh, BJ, do you, are you saved, man? You need to get saved. And he got under conviction. He said, I need to go talk to my dad. The next day we come back and I... I said, uh, hey, did you think any more about what we talked about? He said, uh, he said, yeah, I talked to my dad. And he said, my dad told me that just your soul goes to hell. And your soul doesn't feel anything. All our friends and family are already there. And it's not really a place of pain. It's just where people that aren't saved go. But it's not a place of pain. He said, so daddy told me that me and him both is just going to go there to meet all our family and friends. In America... A mile, maybe, from a good church. And that was their philosophy. I promise you. I don't know where BJ is today, but I promise you if he died, he found out that to be wrong. Hell is forever and forever. Hell would be one thing if it was a sentence for a thousand years. Hell would be one thing if the sentence was for a million years. But the, the dreaded terror and horror of hell is that hell is forever. A million years plus a million years plus a million years. Hell has no end at all. You say, well how could a loving God that, 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 that claims to love people, how could that God send people to hell? He doesn't. Matter of fact, hell was not even created for mankind. Hell was created for the devil when the devil rebelled against God. And hell was created for the devil and all of his angels. But when mankind was tricked into sin, that, the, the sin and the, the, the death of life entered and mankind from that day on could not go to heaven because they had sin on them. They were infected by the bite of sin. And so Jesus did everything he could to restore man. And he came and he lived and he died a perfect man and shed his blood so that you and I do not have to go to hell. Hell's a very real place. J. Harold Smith was one of the greatest men of God that ever preached out of the Bible. He's dead and gone now, but he was... Such a man of God in books I've read about him. They, one of the books I read said that uh, J. Harold uh, preached and in one of the books it said that J. Harold knew 21 men that blasphemed the Holy Ghost and died within 24 hours. And I, as I read some of those accounts, one of them that stuck out to me was there was, uh, he was preaching under a tent one night and said there were three uh, young men sitting in the back at the very back of the tent. They said J. Harold began to preach the word of God. He began to warn people about hell. And just like there always is, there were, there were three or four boys back there on the back and they were laughing and they were snickering while the man of God was preaching. J. Harold was a gentleman. and He didn't get mad at them. But he started walking back. He said, young men, please stop. He said, young men, you don't understand. You're going to make God mad. Please, boys, don't make fun of God. Don't blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Boys, please. And they said over and over, they could just hear J. Harold Smith begging those boys, please, boys, you're going to make God mad. Don't blaspheme the... Please, boys. Hey, back, please. Don't be like... Please. You're going to make God mad. They said the biggest... The roughest and the toughest, the big boy, the cool one. You know, the cool one that thinks it's, it's cool to laugh at the preacher. The real big one, bad to the bone. He stood up and he said, J. Harold, to hell with you and your God. 
And within 24 hours, historically documented, that young man dropped and died with no natural cause. Within 48 hours, the other people with him had passed away as well. No explanation, but they crossed the line and they blasphemed the Holy Ghost and it was over. You don't hear that kind of preaching anymore, but it's true. Just because preachers uh, that are nationally known and they, they try to play around because they want to draw in the masses and they don't tell the whole truth because if you tell the whole truth many times, you can't get all the big crap. But I'm telling you the truth is God is a God of love. God is a God of mercy. God is a God of second chance. But God also is a God of wrath. And when you cross the line with God, Amen. it'll be too late to cry. Another part I read about J. Harold's book, he's preaching a meeting in a little church down in Georgia, and they said there was a, a 16-year-old girl that sat back on the left side, and they said after church, they said J. Harold was known to do this, said the Holy Ghost put one of those girls on his heart. And he walked back there, and he, he said it was the last night of the meeting, he said, honey, he said, won't you come get saved? He said, you got a good mom and daddy. You've been raised in this church. Why, why won't you just let go and come get saved tonight? She didn't get mean or angry. But she said, no, J. Harold. I'm not ready. I don't want to be saved tonight. J. Harold, in his book that I read, said J. Harold looked her in the eyes and said, honey, this could be your last chance. Won't you come get saved? She shook her head and just held on to the pew. They said the service ended and everybody filed out the doors. And that little girl and her family got in the car and turned down the road and they only lived maybe a mile from the church. They said as they turned the ride and they got right near the house, the daddy turned the blinker on and he began to turn the wheel and they began to turn into the drive and around the corner come a drunk driver and that drunk driver at a high speed T-bowed them right on the side and they flipped and they flipped and it punctured a gas line and it threw the mom and daddy out of the car and that daddy in the book was quoted to say that the last thing that he heard his daughter screaming from the back of that car was, Daddy, get me out of this car. J. Harold said I was supposed to get saved. Daddy, I'm not ready to die. I don't want to go to hell. Daddy, get me out of this car. It's too late. It's too late. That little girl died in flames and entered into flames. I don't like that any more than you do. But it's the truth of what happens when somebody rejects the salvation that Jesus gives. I love that little boy of mine to death. There's probably nothing I wouldn't, I, I would gladly lay my life down for my son without thinking about it. But you want to know what would make me more angry than anything? is if my boy worked for a whole month to save up to buy you a gift. And he gave everything he had. He sweated and he poured himself into it. He saved the money and he got you something and he was so excited about coming to church to give you a gift. And he came up to you and said, Hey, I... I really, I really appreciate your friendship. I, I did something for you. I, I bought you something. It, it cost me a lot of money, and I, I bought you something. And you say, what is it? And he hands you the gift, and you say, I, I, don't, I don't want that. And you walk away from it. I promise you this. You'd have a mad daddy on your case. What does it do to the heart of God when he sent his only begotten son and they spit on him, 
They mocked him. They laughed at him. They beat him. They cursed him. They hung him on a cross, hung him on a tree. They didn't give him nothing to drink. They gave him vinegar to drink. They pierced him in the side and they left him to die. And he did it for you. And you got the pride and the arrogancy to come to church and you're too cool for any of it. Let me ask you a question. How angry does that make God? You see where the wrath part comes in now? When you reject what Jesus did for you, it grieves Him, but the wrath of God comes into play there. There's a line that you can cross when it'll be too late. Brother Jared, help me on the piano. I'm done. Preacher, a friend of mine in North Carolina, just recently went to a funeral. And he called me and told me the story. And it was one of, probably one of the craziest things I've ever heard. He said they got to this funeral, and as they got there, uh, an older gentleman had passed away, and the mother, the wife of the husband, and the mother of the whole family was sitting on the front row. Brothers and sisters, and you can picture it, the whole family over here. And on this side, the front two rows were roped off. Nobody could understand it, and everybody had filled in all around it. And there was a big section up front that was roped off. They were fixing to start the service, and the side doors slung open. And a real tall, big law enforcement man come through, and he announced that somebody had pulled some strings and arranged it. Evidently, this man and that woman's son had been in prison for something he's guilty over. And they said, we have pulled some strings and we're, we've allowed him to come sit in his father's funeral. They said, if you approach him, we'll take him out. If you make a scene, we'll take him out, please. Just allow him to say his peace and be here while we're in the funeral of his father. Instantly, the mother began to almost collapse and they cried and that law enforcement stepped to the side and two armed guards brought in this 25 year old young man shackles on his feet and shackles on his hands full orange jumpsuit and he walked in armed guards on both sides and they sat on the front row that preacher told me that mom about lost it said the brothers and sisters were in such turmoil they hadn't seen him in a while. He'd been in prison for over a few years already. They said the preacher began to preach that funeral and began to read things. Said they looked over and that young man just weeping uncontrollably. Said finally, with a blood curling scream. He said, Mama, I'm sorry. Mama, please forgive me. Mama, I should have listened. Mama, I just want to come home. Mama, I just want to come home. I'm sorry, Mama, please forgive me. He said one by one, the mama began to curl out and scream, I love you, son. I love you. We forgive you. We want you to come home. Brothers and sisters begin to cry out and scream how much they loved him and how much they wanted him to come home. That preacher sat on the back row. He said it was one of the most blood-curling things he'd ever heard in his life. He said the guards got the young man and they escorted him out. You see, judgment had already been passed on that young man. And it, didn't have, it did not matter how much mama loved him. It didn't matter how much his brothers or his sisters loved him. The time for repentance is over. 
And there was no way, no matter how much they loved him, that they could get him out of that trouble because it was over. It's too late to cry. It's done. Did you know there's a judgment day coming? This scares me to death because my boy's not saved yet. He's little. Me and Becky pray all the time that God save little Tucker before it's too late. But this is before the tears are wiped away. And I don't know all about this, but I wonder how many people will stand before that judgment seat and say, I, I, I went to church with my mom a couple times and uh, oh, old brother Allred sent a van by my house and I, I went to church a couple times. So was that good enough, God? God looks through his book of life whosoever's name was not found in the book of life is cast into the lake of fire. It has nothing to do with how good you were or how good you weren't. It has to do whether or not your name's in that book of life. I can't imagine. I can't imagine this. Seeing one of my children saying, Daddy, come get me. Daddy, I don't want to go. I should have listened to you. And no matter how much I love him, no matter how much I care, I can't go to where he is because it's too late to cry. I can't answer for you, honey. I can't answer for you, son. I can't answer for y'all. All I can answer for is myself. You want to play games with life? That's your business. But there is a day coming when you will stand before God And he'll either see your name or he'll say the scariest words anybody will ever hear. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. You know how many church kids are in hell right now? You know how many bus kids that came and found religion but they didn't find a relationship are in hell right now? You know how many deacons are in hell right now? You want to know how many Sunday school teachers are in hell right now? You want to know how many people that, that were raised around the premises of a church and was right at the back door, they were Sunday morning people and they, they came in just enough to get their toes wet to appease their family, but they never found a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. And I don't come, to, I've seen preachers preach on hell and they get mad and angry and it almost seems like they're glad people are going. That's not my heart tonight. I wouldn't be doing what God's called me to do if I didn't warn a host of young people and a bunch of other people that there is a day coming and the time's ticking. The clock is ever moving. And one of these days, the clock's going to spread 12 o'clock and it'll be too late to cry. It'll be too late to cry. Preacher, what's your advice? Cry now. Cry out to God now. Lose your stinking pride and your arrogancy. Lose that thought of who, who, well, who's going to say what and who's going to think about this. Oh, well, that somebody's going to say this about me and they'll think this about me. They're going to think I'm a, I'm a crazy Christian and all this stuff. Forget about all of that. You need to worry about one thing tonight. Heaven or hell. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you're from. I don't care what your last name is. I don't care if you've been here for a year, a day, or 15 years. You better know for sure that you're born again. I don't know why God sent me with this. I came with a whole other thought. God told me to preach this. My, my heart's been heavy. My heart's been burdened. And I've done what I've been asked to do. Not one person in here, if you go to hell, your blood won't be on my hands. I've done everything I can do. In a minute, we're going to give you an opportunity to accept or reject what Jesus has done for you. There might be saved people in here. You've been born again and you know it, but you're flirting with disaster. 
You're living two lives. You're trying to please God and you're trying to please the world. You better give it all to Jesus before He ceases to strive with you. There might be somebody here and God's been dealing with you about preaching or being a missionary or doing something and you've been pushing that voice away. You better go ahead and surrender tonight before the Holy Ghost goes and finds somebody else that'll do it. It'll be too late to cry. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed as we stand to our feet. Jared, get that just as I am ready. Choir, I want y'all to help him sing it. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If, if you're saved tonight and all is well with your soul, I need you to go approach the throne room of heaven right now. And ask God to bind the forces of hell. And ask God to save people here tonight. I believe there may be 20 or more in here tonight lost. Need to be saved. There may be Christians and you're wondering from God. Won't you come first and get things right with God? If you're on the altar and you need to be saved, just raise your hand. Somebody will pray with you. Don't wait till it's too late to cry. They're fixing to sing a song. You in here tonight and you may be lost and undone without God or His Son. God's dealt with your heart tonight. Won't you just come to Jesus? If you need to be saved, you come right here to the front. Just stare at me. Stay standing up and look at me if you need to be saved. Would you come as they sing? Just 